Hey there, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this Alchemiculture podcast episode. I am your host, Phoenix Aurelius, and today we are talking with Jim Gale of foodforestabundance.com. We've got so much to talk about in this episode. Something that I'm really, really passionate about is agriculture, producing food, feeding people, creating closed loop systems, so many of these things, and especially the principle of food forestry itself, because in my opinion, it's probably the most hyper sustainable way of producing an abundance of food for long term sustainability, small gardens and farms and things like that, where where people own land, this is probably one of the better ways of setting things up because in three to five years, it becomes a self sustaining ecosystem more or less of its own, and provides all sorts of abundance. So uh, before we hop into it, just a little bit about Jim Gale. Uh, first, he was a four-time All-American national champion wrestler, um, but after college, he ended up moving to Hawaii, backpacking through 37 countries. He loved, lived amongst the Maasai, uh, explored different cultures, and searched for his next inspired vision. Uh, by age 29, he was thinking about what his goals were in life, and he wanted to be retired in three years. He got in and created a mortgage company that reached $1.3 billion in sales in a three-year period, leading him to early retirement and the achievement of a, yet another life goal. But on after that, he bought a boat, lived on the ocean for a year, moved to Costa Rica to build some eco-villages, and it's there that he discovered permaculture, and that's where we get into all of this. So Jim, I would like to welcome you to Alchemiculture, buddy. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing fantastic, Phoenix, and I, I thank you so much for having me on. I just watched some of your videos, and I'm a huge fan already of your work, so thank you. Oh, man, that, that really means a lot. Thank you so much. I'm also a big fan of yours. So, you know, let's let's dive in where the intro left off. You got into permaculture in Costa Rica. What did that look like for you? I mean, you were building some eco-villages. I'm assuming that you were talking to people about how to set up farms and and food situations for these eco villages. Is that correct? Well, so it started out as um, heavy criticism. So I was um, I was building a golf course community. I had um, purchased a bunch of land. I loved the jungle and the energy, the cicadas, the rhythm of the mm -hmm. jungle was. I felt home there. Like I felt just so at peace and alive there. So when I got there, I was on top of the world and I thought I was really cool and I thought I was really smart and all those good things. And then the economy started to shift and I started losing things. And at the same time as I started losing things, I wasn't, I didn't have any financial training in my life. You know, my dad was a pipe fitter. My mom was a, a realtor. Um, I had a kind of typical suburban upbringing. And so I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know about diversification or any of that stuff. So I thought this is the thing I like more than anything in the world. So I'm going to put all my money into it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and now I wouldn't change a thing, by the way. So um, because what I learned there, the amount of money I invested and the education ROI that I got out of that. Well, I couldn't be sitting here without going through that very traumatic experience, which really right. taught me a lesson. Now, I like the Robbins model where you just watch other people and you <laughs> learn from their failures and you learn that way. Well, I wasn't smart enough to do it that way, so I did it my way, <laughs> which is usually the way we do it, right? So I started losing money and the, the whole thing started falling apart. The, it was 2008-9. And the golf course community, and this is before I learned permaculture, we bought this cattle pasture that was just a biological desert, right? There mm -hmm. was like little crick, crick running through with some, some trees. Otherwise, there was a tree like one per acre on this wow. farm, which previously would have been just complete jungle, jungle right? Yeah. Um, so they cleared it all. And my vision for this was to plant fruit trees up and down every fairway and turn it into a biological sanctuary where there's no hunting or anything like that. And what there, there was just food everywhere. Well, I thought that was the coolest vision I could imagine. And again, I didn't know permaculture. And then I started getting criticism from out in the field, right? From yeah. out in the community where people are saying, you're a horrible human being. These developers are destroying our land and all that. And I invited these two women in, um, Jen and Jen, I'll never forget it. And 
what they gave me was so valuable. Um, and I actually, my goal was to invite them in to actually convince them to advocate for what I was doing because I <laughs> thought it was fantastic. Right. Right. Well, after they left, I wiped the blood off and the tears and the sweat <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they, one word stuck out to me. It was the word permaculture. I got online that night and I started researching this and I, and I, I just, I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard of this before, especially they called me nature boy growing up. Right. Right. Um, so I started digging in and at the same time, the economy was failing. All of my assets were going bye-bye. I had my first two girls and this is the biggest catalyst for the change in my perception of the world, because it wasn't just what am I going to do tomorrow yeah. or next week or what trip am I? It's, what is the world going to be like in 20 or 30 years? What's the world of my grandkids going to be like? And that's when I was learning permaculture and learning that we are destroying our system. In fact, all of our systems, it was like systemic destruction yeah. of everything that I held dear. And at that time, I also learned that there are poisons and poison producers that are involved in the destruction, yeah. right? And they want to say that the destruction is bottom up. What I've learned since then is the destruction is top down. It is, it happens so, from the financial level first. You nailed it, yep. So all those things came to me at the same time, which created an, an immense amount of suffering in the form of cognitive dissonance and confusion and fear, <laughs> what's good, what am I gonna do? So I went through that radical period of time, but I'm an optimist at heart. I think we all yeah. are, we're inspired entities, right? We just sometimes forget that we're in spirit. So <clears throat> I started looking for solutions. And the first thing I did after the economy went completely flat in 2010, I started a community called Osa Mountain Village. And first thing we did was bought out this huge uh, fruit tree nursery. We bought thousands of fruit trees. We planted them everywhere using kind of permaculture techniques, really just learning as we are going. Yeah. Right? And the, when I look back on the whole piece, the whole process, that was the part that stuck with me the most. Because once you put them in and you put them in correctly, you can be done if you want to be. Yeah, and it, sure. like you said at the opening, you can literally have abundance forevermore. In fact, a food forest done right is expansive by its very nature. It's true. Yes. So like my buddy Chad Johnson up in northern Minnesota has 300 variety of food and medicine. I got these tinctures from him, actually. I heard you about tinctures. Oh, yeah. And he's estimated tens of thousands of uh, plants, edible and medicinal plants have been planted in the forest around his food forest because the animals will come into his system and then bring the seeds out. Yeah. Is that yeah, magical? That, that, that is actually so magical. Well, and it shows exactly how intertwined ecological diversity is into human agriculture in the first place. When it's done right, it benefits tons of different systems. Yeah. It, it does. It, it everything. It's it's more life. It's more diversity of life, and it's more life, right? And on the flip side of that, and in permaculture, I like to. I think Einstein said, if I want to solve any problem, I'll spend the first fifty-five minutes understanding the problem, and then I can solve the problem in five minutes. You yeah. first have to understand the problem. So then I went down that long rabbit hole of <clears throat> what is the problem asking this question from every different perspective I could imagine. You mentioned the holographic or you mentioned the holographic and fractal realities. I read mm -hmm. Talbot's book three times, yep. blew my mind, right? And so, and then I started realizing this thing about governmente and I started going, wait a minute, all the poisons, all the wars, all the fear, all the destruction comes from this idea that we should give up our own authority over our own lives and not be the authors of our own stories yeah. right and subject ourselves to the authority of somebody else and anyway th that is the start of it and it's just gone incredible from there man that's absolutely amazing so 
once you started planting all of those fruit trees, you were in Costa Rica, how did that turn into foodforestabundance.com or how did that end up shaping it? What's the story to that? Ah, oh, so that is a great question. The, the learning that came from that, every piece along the way has been a different element of a deeper understanding. And, and it was always this, it was always way simpler than I was making it. <laughs> <laughs> and and the why I was making it complicated always had to do with some type of ego thing. Now, I, I am not an anti-ego guy. I think there's no such thing as other than ego. Like we are right. self and everything we do is because we think we're going to feel better in the doing of it. Right. A hundred percent. It's impossible for a human being not to do that. You know, Mother Teresa, if the story is true, she gave her whole life. But why did she do that? because it was the best thing that she could imagine herself doing for selfish reasons. Right? Yeah. So anyway, along this path, I was learning and really studying neurolinguistics and psychology. And my intent back when I first created that with the goal of creating a, a demonstration community that could show the world how to live in joy and abundance. Well, what I learned from that is when I brought the people in, I did not have any filters. And anybody who wanted to come, and then I later found out three of them were ex-felons, and um, a lot of people were coming, running away from something. Sure. And they were coming out of fear. It was 2012. The, a lot of them were the Mayan calendar ones. And I'm not, yeah. I, I think that all this stuff is actually happening at the same time right now. But yeah. it's, what is our primary motivation? Is it towards peace and love and joy and beauty or is it away from which is fear-based so i invited all these people up and then we had one restaurant and one pool and one bar one community the election cycle started and everybody started fighting yeah it was nuts so i learned that there's building new sustainable communities is just silly now, if somebody's developing, they want to build a community, build one, right? But if our goal is to create a sustainable, regenerative, abundant world to thrive, we first have to look in zone one from a, yeah. from a level four perspective, right? A universal perspective. Zone one is the backyard of every person who's got a lawn. Yeah. You know, this is, this is actually really cool, Jim, because one of the things that I've talked about for years is you know, the, the way that things are going to transform to be more sustainable is not this drastically different model than what we have right now. Like we can't get rid of all of the houses and the suburbs and the neighborhoods and all those things. They're already too expansive. The resources are already there. People are going to have a hard time uprooting, moving way out. And what, what happens to that house when they move out into the country, build new structures and all these things, it's just more waste. It's like a cancerous growth. So realistically, what we're going to have to do is take a look at how we can restructure the cities and the neighborhoods and things like that that we already have into more sustainable uh, situations. And that, that really happens like everybody is empowered to be able to do that right now. Seeds are pretty cheap. You know, you can buy a fruit tree this year two or three fruit trees, maybe next season, so on and so forth, put them in various places and work slowly. It doesn't have to be this professionally designed, you know, thing where, where you set it in straight from the get go, it's all planted so that in a perfect three years, like if you plan on living in some place for five, 10, 15 years, you may as well start setting things like this up. No um, brainer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here in Utah, in particular, we have these Huge, and this is this happens in, in various other parts of the nation too, but you just have these blocks where houses actually line an entire block, you know, on all four corners. And in between them, if they were to knock down fences or whatever else, that's already a community that has all of the space that's necessary for eco-sustainability and sustainability of that little area. They're usually like if they're on a hill or down in a little valley or have a little creek running through there. Now it's a microclimate and it's yeah. going to specialize in one particular type of produce or type of production and other things like that, where they can focus for economic sustainability and interdependence. 
So. Oh, that's exactly right. So this idea of doing new things and using more resources is was my was one of my need to know what I needed to learn thing. So, um, the, you know, there's 40 to 50 million acres of lawn just in the United States. If we turn 30 percent of that into regenerative agriculture using the edges, you know, keep 30, 40, 50 percent, 70 percent yeah. of your lawn, just use your edges and use it in a way that serves you 100%. So what we, another piece, the psychological piece of this is how are we going to transform our society? Is it going to be by force and mandate or is it going to be a voluntary inspired change? And that's the part, that's where we can, that's where I think we spend our energy for the best return on investment of that energy. It's all about vibration. It's all about it raising our energy and living in spirit with a clear mind and then following the messages that come, which is in the form oftentimes of feelings, yeah. like a feeling of joy. If it's joyful, go that direction. Yes, man. I think that that's really important. Let's go ahead and take our first break. But when we come back, I want to touch more on that because, you know, everybody is really up in arms about things like Agenda 2030, Agenda 2050, um, you know, the future of how the quote unquote elite and, you know, all these other, you know, miscellaneous moving targets want to shape humanity. And people are very much so against that. But by focusing on that problem instead of the solution to achieve the same end, we might be focusing on the wrong thing. So let's unpack that when we come back. A lot of people write in and ask us where we source our herbs. Well, some of them I grow or wild harvest myself. Others I pay to do the same thing for me. I scour high quality Asian herb suppliers. I've even developed relationships with really unique purveyors and even some growers over the years. But one place that we've relied upon for almost 20 years now is Mountain Rose Herbs. This company sets a standard for green companies as they're the first zero waste company in Oregon. Their whole facility runs off of renewable energy, their fleet vehicles run on biodiesel, they have sustainable packaging, they're beyond fair trade, they support small farms all over the world, and they're just an all-around badass company. We have a long-standing relationship with them, and we know that we can trust the quality of all the herbs, spices, teas, oils, body butters, and other health goods that they have in stock. Everything they have is certified organic, fair trade, and or wild harvested, and they have really strict COAs, or certificates of analysis. Even though we have a lot of herbal suppliers, they remain one of our main go-to shops when we're looking for high-quality herbal starting materials. We highly recommend checking them out, stocking up on some herbs, teas, or even body care supplies. And of course, we're an affiliate of Mountain Rose Herbs, so every purchase you make when you use our affiliate link directs a portion of your purchase to support and fund this podcast and support our other research here at the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy. To get our link, just head to phoenixaurelius.org slash thealchema-culture-podcast. Scroll down to the link on the Mountain Rose Herbs icon, and that will direct you to their site. As always, thank you so much for supporting our work by using our affiliate links each time you choose to shop with them. Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Phoenix Aurelius. We're here with Jim Gale of foodforceabundance.com. Right before the break, we were actually just talking about how a lot of the answers come down to utilizing the resources we already have. And you brought up a very crucial point. Uh, while we were on the break, I was talking about, you know, the agenda 2030, agenda 2050, how the quote unquote elite want to be able to corral people into these hyper efficient uh, kind of domestic zones so that, you know, the rest of nature gets left alone and so on and so forth. And that's, that's definitely one way, like if you were in charge and needed to herd people and people weren't taking accountability for themselves or, or the environment or other things like that, that, that maybe is one model. But it definitely tramps on a lot of liberties, for sure. And the other part of it is that we can take you know, responsibility for understanding the ecology, understanding food production, understanding agriculture, and put it all together. Food forestry seems like that's one very important 
step or one very important implementation that can be made towards that goal, wouldn't you say? Uh, I would say that. In fact, there's one thing stronger, more powerful than all of the armies of the world. And that is an idea whose time has come. And here's the magic of this. When we unpack this, right? All of the armies, which is governmentes of the world is what kind of we have to be considered of right now more than ever, but always, but especially now. Yeah. And the idea whose time has come, but Victor Hugo said this a long time ago, yeah. implies that the idea is already out there and that it's time for this idea to be realized, right? Yeah. So then that begs the question, what's the idea? Well, Everybody I've all, everybody that I've spoken to not only has heard of the idea, but they can describe it in glorious detail. <laughs> and true. if you ask them to sit in, in with their eyes shut and imagine that they're in it, they will be smiling or at very minimum, they'll be content and, and relatively joyful. The idea is the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Garden of Eden is not a utopian fantasy. It's a logical step for humanity. And so to, to say, y'all, it's the ultimate stack of functionality. It wipes out mass extinction and deforestation. It reverses all this. It reverses cancer and diabetes and heart disease. It takes the value in the abundance of our society to a level that is both enlightenment and the physical, the metaphysical, which is enlightenment, and the physical, which is the Garden of Eden, is something that I, I, I very much believe we're going to have in 20 years. I think so, too. I mean, the, already, I've seen the trends. I've been in agriculture for about 20, almost 25 years myself. So being able to see the increase of people who are interested, who in, in the past would never have cared about it even 10 years ago you know not even worrying about within like about the last four or five years there's a lot more people who are very interested and engaged in agriculture and doing things you know keeping <laughs> keeping their own animals and and you know everything it, it's a really important principle you know I think that what we should probably think about doing for our listener base is unpacking some of these ideas. So for those of you who haven't heard about food forestry, Jim, how would you describe food forestry? Food forestry, permaculture principles is everything starts with design, right? And this could be something you do by going on YouTube and looking up what a peach tree guild is, and then searching the plants, the nitrogen fixers, the pollinator attractors, and the different plants that might flower at different times of year, and put this guild together where you don't just have one peach tree, and that's awesome by itself. Yeah. But when you stack it, when you add layers to the soil, and maybe some tubers in some part of the peach tree, maybe that wants more sun. You know, some gym, ginger or turmeric on one side that gets half sun of the day, some longevity spinach and Okinawa spinach and Suriname spinach on another side that's an understory side with a little bit of dapple light, right? And you put this thing together, you've now all of a sudden you've got 20 different types of food growing where with a peach tree as the primary element of the system, right? So that's what a food forest is, and that's compounded. So in, yeah. in like at Gulf's Landing, we're building an off-grid community completely. And this is my personal community. It's where my personal lifetime home is going to be. And 52 acres, and we're planting thousands of edible plants everywhere. It's going to be like the, everywhere. It's going to be food and butterflies and good smells and beauty and birds. And, and then I'm going to use that as a demonstration site to show people how easy this is relatively speaking, there's nothing easier. Yeah, it's true, actually, because when you set up things, and again, you know, from my perspective, food forestry is basically utilizing a structured set of principles to where there's usually about seven different layers of food and medicine growth that not only serves agricultural function, but it also serves ecological function, like Jim was talking about. And so where you, you might have a particular peach tree in the mix of maybe lots of other diverse types of fruit trees as well, but around that peach tree, having what he called a guild, which is basically members, ecological members of the plant community that are able to synergize off of each other in such a way that everything benefits. 
the animals that are there who might partake of the insects or even of the grasses, of the, the grains, of other things that can, can be grown inside of there and greens as well, um, all the way on up to macro elements of the human uh, harvest, everything supports everything else so that there's a greater resiliency and a greater diversity that ecologically helps to take care of all of the needs of that particular tree and the rest of the plants growing in its proximity. And for me, I think that the metaphor is absolutely beautiful in setting things like this up because you are what you do. That's one third of what a person is, right? You are what you do, you are what you say you do, and you are what other people say that you do. And so one third of the, the composition of what a human being is really centers around what you do. And when you're going out and creating systems of harmony and of interdependence in a way that develops resilience, how do you think the rest of the things in your life are going to end up, right? You're uh, performing the ritual with the plants to set the subconscious structures up for the rest of your life to follow in a very similar way. Uh, plants are the best teachers. They really are, man. Consistency and love and awareness and observation. And they talk so in their own language. I mean, you see a leaf looking a little funny. You know that, that there's something that plant needs something, right? And just observing. I mean, when Bill Mollison talks about observing like the jungle and seeing the plumes coming up in certain areas. And then over here, there's a little vortex and over here, mm -hmm. it's just epic and now you got Sepp Holzer that he's growing lemon trees in the uh, Austrian Alps yeah. um, you know where it's below zero where no you can't do that well wait a minute well, he he's did. doing it yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then in that he's he's we're busting through paradigms left and right and it, this expansion of human consciousness is so exponential right now that What's coming is, is beyond what any of us can conceive, but I'm working at it. And it's a lot of fun because, because what I see is just so much vibration and abundance and love and joy. And, and it's thanks to these teachers that, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of these guys and going, oh my gosh, thank you. Because I know my role is to look at it from this fourth person perspective, like up yeah. and say, how can I affect this the most? What? what's the most I can do for this system? And so I found my niche, right? And, if, and that's the niche that inspires me the most. Other people get really into the soil. Matt Powers does a fantastic sure. thing on like worm poop, right? Yep. And we need that so bad. And I, I'm so thankful for every layer of the system because it's like, a, it's like a telescope and a microscope combining. And when we take a look at the far and the close, from our perspective and we put it all together it's just pure logic yeah it really is well and i think that it's it's really important that people start thinking about this because this is the way to take the future into your own hands if you have food you lessen your reliance upon external systems of communication of networking of transportation of food importation etc 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 and, you know, in this day and age where so many people trade in their time for money, trade in their money for their needs, it's like, well, I would rather do this other thing. But that's like working on the computer is not real right. outside of our monetary system. You could do that all day long. And unless you are using it just as a tool to map out ideas that mm -hmm. will then, you know, it's the same as handwriting something to map out an idea so that you can understand it better to, in order to implement it. It's not real, it's all fake. There's just perceived value. There's no intrinsic value to that model. But where there is intrinsic value is what are you going to eat today? Yeah. What are you going to eat tomorrow? How are you going to stay alive? That is the intrinsic value that is and has always been part of the human and all of the animal paradigm because yeah. life comes from life. You have to consume life in order to perpetuate life. Yeah, yeah, it's very so, well said. Uh, I love our comments. I love thinking about these things from very deep and different perspectives. It helps give me more talking points because my goal is to be an effective communicator that 
my goal is to help catalyze a shift in consciousness leading to mass adoption mm -hmm. of the most logical thing we could ever do for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's important that people really get behind this idea and start implementing it. And, you know, uh, one of the things that people have, have talked to me is, as a permaculture designer and as somebody who has promoted agriculture in all of its forms for many, many uh, decades now, is how do we, you know, if we're just renting or if you're in an apartment, how do you engage in these types of principles? Well, the answer is it doesn't matter how much or how little space you have, sustainable food growing and ecologically clean principles can be enacted anywhere. Yeah. Right. Anytime. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people asked me that question just earlier today. Uh, I was asked that, what can I do inside? And so we design indoor grow rooms as well. Um, thank you to the cannabis industry who has perfected this over yeah. many decades. Um, the, the combination of the lighting and some, some use aquaponics or hydroponics. I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of soil, especially indoors. Um, I, I do like aquaponics, but not maybe... Um, well, for instance, here's the aquaponics I love. We built a, um, we took the spring water out of the well at Osa and it was high up on the, on the mountain and we plumbed it. So enough went to the community to serve the community and all of the overflow went to a strategically located tilapia pond or fish pond. Yeah. And then from there, that overflow fertigated the gardens. And then from there, it went through the system back into the river, back into the, those are my favorite systems because there's no pumps needed. You just let the water do its thing and it, everybody wins. See, I think that that's really smart. I've designed a couple of really next level hydroponics slash aquaponic. We actually ended up just calling it bioponics where a hundred percent of the inputs are actually grown in the system. So you know, you can circulate using pumps and things like that, but the system itself does not need outside input. And um, we also have, you know, soil-based wicking beds so that that same water that's flowing through can flow through a chamber that wicks up the moisture so you don't have watering from the top to do. It runs like aquifer system does in nature. And just using those natural systems and human ingenuity and how can we synthesize something to work exactly the way that nature does in a way that might be slightly different from nature, like the 14th floor of an apartment building, right? Yeah, I love that. In fact, I would like your help. Um, we are, we just dug a 6.2 acre pond at Goss Landing because of, um, to, we, to have the houses, we had to dig this pond. Yeah. Um, and we want to turn it into an epic system. A, a, in a live system that produces an abundance of fish, um, like dragonfly plants that the dragonflies like to lay their larvae in so they can come up and eat the mosquitoes. And I mean, we want to literally put it all together. And it sounds like you know some stuff about that. I do. I've done quite a bit of different things concerning awesome. all, all forms of aquaculture, even, you know, how to be able to selectively grow duckweed to bring in waterfowl and to process the duckweed into pellets and so on and so forth, all just using very natural systems that where one thing feeds off of the next thing uh, consistently so that there's not any, any imbalance inside of the system. You kind of curtail a smaller ecosystem. But I've done this in houses. I've done it in cannabis grows. I've done it in nature. You know, we were thinking on this property in Colorado, they had like this small little creek and we wanted to create a trout farm and slalom for them that, you know, has zigs back and goes uphill and downhill and has little resting ponds and so on and so forth because trout need to go upstream to spawn. If they don't, then they start to become flaccid and they, they have, you know, lesser quality nutrition to them. Their muscle fibers aren't as dense. And so therefore eating the, the food that's in there is not really a good idea. You don't want to eat diseased food systems. Right. And a lot of people are doing that with tilapia. We got to see in the system I learned in, there were so many tilapia. The tilapia would actually, you know, they, they would go from one gender to another. The males would start laying eggs. They, I mean, so many things because they're in these high stress environments. Right. And as soon as you take them out of these unnatural environments, put them back into a healthy environment that they would normally be in, 
that seems to straighten everything else out. It, and it makes so much sense. We were talking earlier too about like, if you wanna know the truth of something, if, if something's healthy or unhealthy, feed it to a plant, yes. right? The plant will tell you if that's healthy or not healthy more than our discernment is able to. You know, they hire these people at these companies where their only job is to find the chemical combination that will get you to eat more poisons. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> that's a really freaking job. Yep. What's it like to, to realize after like 20 years of doing that job that you just probably killed like a half a million people or whatever, right? <laughs> I know, seriously. Jeez. So, and, and, and then too, with that said, I don't want to leave because I'm, I'm shame and fear and guilt and rage are the opposite of, of a healthy spirit and a healthy system, right? Their energy levels, their low vibration. So I like to share with anybody who is doing that job. Hey, I was asleep too. You know, when, yeah, when Obama first got elected, I had tears of joy. Because I thought, oh, this guy is great. He's going to stop all the wars because uh, blah, blah. Well, then he went and bombed the shit out of everybody. Like, <laughs> exactly. It's like, oh, oh business as usual. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, with that said, what we, I, what I love doing is inspiring the stormtrooper out of their shell, out of their whatever they call that uniform. Yeah. You know, that's, that's really big. And again, coming back to solutions, like problems face us all the time. And I think that it's good that, and it's important to go through a phase where we identify what the problem is, because that inspires all of those emotions and other things inside of us that can ultimately be channeled properly. If we don't go through that phase, we don't really have the same purpose, drive, or determination that we would as if we were to get riled up about something worked up and have that be what channels into the solution. And realistically, people should be pretty outraged at certain things that are going on. But again, the better way to channel that rage is into what am I doing right now to be able to make this a situation where it's not able to corral me? Right. For instance, if you can't put economic pressure through living wages, basically on a person because they're so self-sustaining, then you don't have control of them anymore. And that's what people need to realize is like, oh, how do I put myself into the most self-sustainable situation possible so that I cannot be leveraged in any way that is against my will? And food and ecology meet perfectly with food forestry and permaculture principles. Like that's, that's a huge yes. point of it, right? Yeah, uh, exactly right. And, and Henry Kissinger back 50 some years ago said, if you want to control nations, control oil. If you want to control people, control food. If yeah. you want to control the world, control the world's currency. Yeah. Right. So let's just focus on the people part. Right. That, by the way, those weren't the ramblings of a, a madman. <laughs> I mean, yes, he is a madman, but yeah, yeah. they were also the strategy of the person that was in charge of implementing the strategy who has met for some reason with every president. Why, why is yeah. that? Well, it's because he's part of the system. He's a strategist for population control. And then when you take that and then add to this, the quote by uh, Gerta who said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. And when I first heard these, this, especially that one, I'm like, oh, fuck off. I'm not a yeah, slave. I know, seriously. You know? But it's and like, then, wait, actually, all the ways that I am. Yeah, yeah, all the ways. And when you start listening to me, you start realizing, what is a slave? It's somebody who's controlled in the mind. So they do the bidding for another person. And I'm, I'm eating some chips and I'm like, oh, shit, I'm a slave to these little <laughs> bastards, right? And whoever's selling them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some points of slavery I'm still not over, but I'm working on it. Well, I think there's some points that right now we, we can't be over, you know, to draw on uh, Buckminster Fuller. He says, you know, you can't fight against a system that you want to change because that system is in place. It, it already has a certain amount of power, right? The best thing that you can do is create a new system that makes the old system obsolete. And that doesn't happen out of nothing. Something always comes from something. And so we have to take the energy and the resources from the system that is and rework them and reimagine them into something that 
is no longer that that's the part of the same system. And so what this comes down to for communities is right now, go to your grocery store. How many different types of produce do you have? Like bananas, apples, oranges, you know, all of your, your turnips, radishes, all your root veggies, potatoes, onions, garlic, all, okay, all these things. How do you produce these locally? Bananas can be grown and should be grown just about anywhere, especially where the air is really crap because banana leaves filter out tons of toxins inside of the air. You know, they, they can actually help to clean the air. And so in places here like Utah, if we were to have, take some of the West Desert and actually install these semi-tropical greenhouses where we can grow bananas and guavas and other things all year round running just off of solar power because there's nothing out in the desert at all. Right, right. Then boom, now we are literally closing the loop and not requiring our bananas to come from Costa Rica, Panama, right. you know, yeah. South America. And that cuts out enormous amounts of money from the corporations that are dealing with, you know, airlines and jet fuel and yeah. the, the big fruit companies, which by the way, are basically using a form of subsidized slavery yeah. for how the food is harvested and produced in the first place. You can't buy a bunch of bananas for 39 cents and equitably pay the farmer. Right. Try it. You and, can't do right. it. And they're mining soil and they're destroying the habitat where they're farming because they're using monocultures and systems that are not natural. And then to share with them and to have them see that you can do like Bill Molson when he created the banana circle and he put the compost in the middle, all of a sudden his yield went up so much that I still have a trouble. Like it was like <laughs> way more than a hundred percent. Like it was yeah. like crazy right and then and then you try it and like oh my god that's incredible what happens so mimicking these natural systems that have been proven you know the thing that i like to convey the most is that what i'm advocating is that people enjoy their life and become healthy in and there's only benefits to this yes. right there's no negatives unless you're one of the one out of a million or whatever that are controlling the minds of everybody and want to continue <laughs> to control right. the health and the minds everybody else wins Yep. And nature wins too, because, you know, as, as people have been talking about at least my entire life, you know, they'll say in summation, and this was mostly considered to be tree huggers up until about five to 10 years ago was trees are the answer. And how are trees the answer? Well, first of all, they help to clean and hold on to tremendous amount of moisture. They condition the soil, aerate the soil, bring mycelium through the forest floor and through the soil. They are proliferative in a number of different ways, and they give environments to not only further vegetative matter, you know, dozens of things. You, you have your tall trees, you have smaller trees, you have your shrubs, you have your grasses, you know, you have uh, all of the other flowers and other things that grow below that. You have, you know, all of the root type of materials that exist, uh, cassava and other things, especially in tropical environments. You have all of these things that are growing in that environment. And then the animal hosts, the insect hosts, I mean, billions and billions and billions of forms, especially if we were to take into account the microbes that it gives life to. Okay, now we're in probably the quintillions. <laughs> yeah, it's infinite in a way throughout the lifetime of a tree because what comes off of, off of that, and then like you said earlier, when you design it to serve the goals and the desires of the human that's living there, the family or the community, yeah. now you've got the ultimate stack. Right. Where it's just it, it's more life and more energy in a system. Yeah. Well, and that's that's really if I think that there's one thing really, Jim, that people need to get on board with. It's that listen, if you are of the mindset that you should be governed, continue on that and see where it goes. You, you've already been on that path. You see where it goes. You, people complain about their government every damn hey. day. And they're like, how do we change it? How do we do this? How do we do that? There, there's one solution. Or take accountability and become a steward of your environment. Hey, look, there's the next generation. There's my little motivation. Oh, <laughs> she, she came, she heard me talking and came running. I'll give oh. you a hug later, kiddo. Oh, you, yes. So it's, she's two years old. I'm 52. Just had a two-year-old girl. Wow. I've got four daughters. And that's 
anytime if I'm feeling a little bit lazy, which I actually haven't felt for quite a while now, but when I was before I really resonated into this new vibration, I would think of them. And then I would instantly have that motivation, right? Like, yeah. okay, I got something to work for, right? Besides just the joy of it. I've never had more fun in my life. That's true. Yeah. Parenting is great, but it does, it, it, takes your whole perspective from what am I doing today or even in the next five years with my life. And it puts this long-term time span yeah. on the proliferation of the family line. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does. It does. It, it's such a, a fun thing. Like there's an olive tree in the Greek Isle of Crete that was planted over 2000 years ago. That's still producing olives. And just to think about what can come <laughs> of this, it, it just further gives me this energy of, I don't sleep much anymore, but it's not, I'm never tired. I just don't want to sleep. There's a, a new thing. Like I can, I have this super, like I can feel my hands. I can, this vibration is just so intense lately. Do you feel that? Oh yeah, man. It's been, it's been progressively ramping up for years too. I think yeah. the more in tune somebody becomes, that becomes their experience. Like you don't need to rest so much from the things that already give you energy during your waking life. Yeah, exactly. It's just pure bliss. Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss and truer yep. words have never been spoken, right? Yeah, just that's true. Follow that which inspirits us and creates entheosiasm, right? <laughs> I like that entheosiasm. That's like putting God in, you know, the, the divinity, so to speak, into yeah. things. That's great. Making it very apparent. Um, so we created a whole business around this because it's scale is what, you know, there's a couple questions I have with regard to timing. You know, I, I look at this as, you know, this is our divine experience and the goal of this experience. I don't believe in destiny as a script, but as a potential. Sure. Right? And I think that the goal of any experience, like as soon as I first heard the term enlightenment and I understood what that meant then I can't settle for anything less because yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's always something else. Right. And, and then one, there's, there's, there's never an end to the expansion. Right. That's and that's true, what we're, yeah. that's what we're the, I think we're on the leading edge of the expansion of everything that is. And this contrast, this friction without that, we wouldn't have the expansion. You know, I think that that's so important. If we were to plot it out like a diagram, to me in my head, it kind of looks like there are these planes of ignorance. And at some point they coalesce, that point would be the point of awareness, possibly even love, but then it just funnels outwards forever from there too. So you have, you know, ignorance can be infinite and then enlightenment or, you know, illumination or however you want to call it also infinite in the other direction. It's just, you know, hitting at that midpoint helps to navigate where you want to go and the more that you stay in those higher vibes the, the oh. better off you know you are and moving upwards towards that scale yep yep expanding everywhere so yeah that's that's been a lot of the the fun of it lately and the magic that's happened like we launched about six months ago and about a month later the producer of my favorite tv show for 10 years of my life the crocodile hunter calls and says we'd like to do a show with you. And I was like, yes, this is great. Let's Please. do it. <laughs> two, and then two days later, the a guy who was my favorite actor for five years from another TV show, an A-lister <clears throat> calls up and says, Jim, I'd like to do a food for us. Come over and let's talk about this. So we actually put the two together and we just finished a pilot TV show that is going to inspire millions of people. Wow. And it's a series of TV shows all about permaculture and the why, right? Because once we know the why, the how, it yep. takes care of itself. So really focusing all of the different whys, right? And so that's been a, a, a lot of conversation around how do we communicate the problem in such a way that doesn't leave people feeling down, but, but then say, here's the problem, but now what's the solution? And when we can go back and forth between those things, always ending on the vision of what's possible, I, I have the feeling that it's it's really unstoppable at this point. And of course, it was all started and it's all, per, millions of people are already doing this. I'm just doing it the best I can. 
Sure. Yeah. Well, and using influence and reach in order to help inspire others, you know, it's, that's a brilliant way of doing it. There's, there's no real better way because people will inherently see if something works or something doesn't work, the fruits of your labor are the, the food of their thoughts and the food of what's possible for them as well. And, you know, I think it's important. You don't need to be a billionaire. You don't need to have all of the resources to be able to put plants in the ground, <laughs> you yeah. know, like it's the most innate thing of the human experience for possibly the last six to 10,000 years. You know, yeah. that's been the name of the human game. Is, is all you really need is energy, right? If you could start with energy and then a spark of an idea or a seed of awareness, and then you nourish that seed, whether it be an idea or an actual plant seed, it's the same thing in a way. And then it just goes from there and it creates more energy, the more you nourish it. Exactly. Right? And, and then just, and then, and then using the permaculture principles in business is so much fun, you know, working the edges and valuing diversity and observing and stepping back and going back in. And then the stacking functions one is my favorite. I'm always <laughs> looking for new ways to stack. Yeah. But, well, that's awesome. Let's actually go ahead and take a break. When we come back, let's unpack that concept as well because i think it's something that's not just relevant to business not just relevant to permaculture but to everybody's lives in fact if they were to plan out their lives and their own goals how variously diverse they might be using these principles we would begin to see the same types of fruition that we see when we apply them in the ground or when we apply them to our business right so it's an important philosophy all right stay tuned folks we'll be right back Have you heard about our Spagyrics of the Month Club yet? As you probably know, we release five new Spagyrics each month. These range in the style of Spagyric Pharmacopoeia from tinctures, elixirs, essences, clysi, stones, and much more. But now, you can get your hands on all five new releases each month at just a fraction of the normal cost by being part of our Spagyrics of the Month Club. It's the very best way to inexpensively build your home Spagyric Apothecary, and it's also the best way to support our Research Academy. Participating is easy. Sign up for the $75 a month subscription on our website, and we ship you a four mil size of all five newly released Spagyrics that month. And shipping's even included for all orders within the USA. The best part is you just sign up once and sit back and receive your new Spagyrics delivered right to your door. It really doesn't get any easier. To get started or to learn more, go to phoenixaurelius.org and scroll down to the Spagyrics of the Month Club area on our homepage. As always, thanks so much for supporting our work. Hey there, everybody. We're here with Jim Gale. We're back from the break. Thanks for listening. Before we went to the break, we were just talking about how we should unpack some of the permaculture principles and maybe even talk about how they're relevant, not only in permaculture and business, but how they can also be relevant to individuals' life situations. So Jim, like what, what, what would you say is one of the most foundational of the permaculture principles where things really start? Like what, what, what's the basis of that for you? Um, the basis is to observe the experiences that we have and to question um, the, the success or failure, right? And, and how is that relevant? How we feel is my, my favorite way to determine if something is um, valuable, sustainable, or unsustainable, right? Does it have, make me feel joy or make me feel sadness, right? At the end, is there any unsustainable part to it? Like I used to drink a lot, um, grew up and just partied a lot. And yeah. over time, I'm like, God, it's really not sustainable. It's fun <laughs> in the short term, but then there's a tax to pay, right? Yeah. When we're doing something that is purely in alignment with our nature, then there's no, the, there's no tax, there's no theft, there's no violence, <laughs> there's no harm. It's just pure good. So that, that do no harm. And th there's another thing to unpack here. A lot of permaculturalists um, that I met kind of take the position of um, fair share means communism or capitalism or something, right? Yeah, that's and <laughs> now, now, sharing is a word that to me advocates the voluntary exchange of something. Yes. Right. Well, 
socialism and communism are based in violence. They're based in the forced exchange. Now that's not sharing. That's, yeah. that's not at all sharing. So those are some things I like to kind of open up people's minds to these ideas. So I think that the way we change the world is by advocating all these ideas in alignment with, with voluntarism and inspired action. And then when we can really put those permaculture principles to that, I believe, I'm very certain that that's the way I, that's the world I want to live in. Yeah, so that's the world I'm promoting. <laughs> you know, I think that that's really important, especially from an economic perspective. A lot of people, when they think about, you know, creating sustainability and all these things, because of how it's been embraced historically in the United States and possibly even other Western countries by more leftist ideals, they tend to think that it is a system of socialism or it's a design of socialism and all these other things where not necessarily like you can still have a capital or even hyper capitalistic society that utilizes these same principles where there is still such an abundance to what is to be had. Not only will people who can pay pay for these services and other things, but like you said, you can share voluntarily what you have with the abundance and the, and the excess that is inherently produced in the system. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the other thing that I think about every day as far as how to apply this to my life, and, and by the way, questions, asking relevant questions has been also something that's been incredibly impactful to my life. It, it, changing from ap affirmations to questions opens the mind in a different way. Um, but this question about how can I stack functions to design my own life to be the ultimate life that I can imagine, right? And then I keep imagining new things. <laughs> um, and so we're building this community and, and building a house, actually several houses on about four and a half acres. And we're designing then the yard, the landscape to be the ultimate stack of functions, and then I'm turning my life into a demonstrator of this, right? So there's yeah. gonna be video stations. I'm gonna be walking through the gardens and wherever it's the most beautiful lookout, we'll have a station where maybe I could do a pull up or a bench or a squat or something. So all of a sudden you're in nature, observing the plants, the butterflies, the energy, the bees, and they've studied a lot of this stuff. The act of gardening is like as good as ex exercise or yoga for your body, for your mind, yeah. or for your spirit, for your health. Right. So you stack all these things and then turn it into a business model. And then I said, OK, how do we scale that? Because when we can demonstrate that helping people grow food and helping to create the Garden of Eden is just good business, then all of a sudden we bridge that gap. And then that's what we've done. Yeah, it's just another incorporation of the sociological structure that is at present that once they get focused on this other thing that's how the change happens that's where people will inherently go because it makes sense yeah. it's easier to structure easier to run less effort you know i when when i talk to a lot of people that uh, like clients that i consult for and things especially in the past i haven't done so much agricultural stuff over the past three years but um, at least in terms of consulting for other people. But before that, I was very, very, very heavily entrenched in doing that for hemp farmers and all sorts of growers. And they just think that I'm nuts when I go on there. It's like, hey, you want to grow hemp? Let's drive the diversity. What other crops can you grow around here in order to help the hemp? Like, for instance, you know, you grow comfrey around your hemp not only can the comfrey leaf be used as a preparation to help and strengthen the the stock and prevent from wind damage and other things like this but it also actually helps the terpene profile of the plants yeah. and gives them a greater you know a, a greater effect a greater aroma and so on and so forth but you know the, one of the things that um people would constantly ask is you know how how do I increase the yield that I'm having? How do I increase you know the the volume that each plant is putting out? And it's like, well, grow lots of other things around it. And currently, the idea, and this is sociological as well, is 
to compete. It's a competing system. So how would that help out? And it's like, no, <laughs> you don't want to grow your tomatoes right next to your hemp because that would be a competing thing. Yeah. But when you grow other interdependent plants that have different root depths, now it actually helps to condition the soil, drive microbiological diversity in the soil, help drive through decompositional layers year over year over year. It helps to actually increase the diversity and stop the amount of inputs that need to be put in. Yeah. Most farmers today, just like most people today who are not farmers, put into their proverbial soil additive over additive over additive over additive, and yet the soil gets more and more depleted. Yeah. Just to say, you know, your average Joe puts more and more and more money into the resources that it takes for them to live, their soil that, you know, you reap what you sow kind of thing. And unfortunately, it continues to be more depleted. It's only when you can really think about and drive that diversity inside of any given system so that it all one thing feeds the next thing. Yeah. That's the only way that we can really break out of the current model of consumption and competition. Yeah. Our, our mindset and our agriculture are one yeah. and they always have been. Big time. So I'm going to unpack two things you said. One is one system is unsustainable. All unsustainable systems fail. And when we're, we're talking about a system where six companies control, what, 91% of the food supply around the world, uh, something like that. And those companies are owned and controlled by two companies, which is really yeah. owned controlled by one, right? Probably. Yep. Uh, but I, I know it goes to two, probably to one. Um, and then the other way you're saying is actually expansive and regenerative and it just creates more and more and more abundance um that's this when when people can see that it, it starts helping me to choose better right in fact this, this idea of choice the word choice is misused almost always because the word itself implies that there is awareness of choice and when there's not an awareness then it's not a choice exactly yeah, it's choosing from a limited field. It's not even choosing. It's just like, ugh. Yeah, it's like program, right? What, what will the, provide me the least pain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that that is, yeah, such an, it's like the death of the spirit, right? When, you, when, you, when we're thinking in those terms, which yeah. is what these entities are purveying all over the media to hold people's minds in a state of confusion and stress and fear, right? And so by knowing that, we turn the shit off and yep. we go stand outside and look at the butterflies and be like, oh my God, life is amazing. Right. So the other ones you used are competitive and collaborative is the words I use. Right. Yep. This th our business model is I spent about a quarter million dollars getting a franchise ready to take. Originally, it was going to be to take the my greenhouse uh, systems to market. And then I when I got this 244 page FDD and 89 page operations manual, it made me sick to my stomach. I threw the whole pile of shit in the trash. <laughs> Every line in that damn document was a line about control. Wow. And now we have a two page contract and it is based on the voluntary exchange of value. We threw away all of our patents, all of our non-competes, all of our non-disclosures. And we've made a business model out of being transparent because it's good business. Yeah. Right. So people are trying to figure out the angle. It's just good business because I'm selfish is the angle. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's when it's most pure, right? Because I mean, if there's one thing that's true that every single human being has, it's that they need to look out for themselves. You, you can't change that. And if you can accept that the reason this person's in business to feed them their damn selves and their family, and that that's the end goal of it, that's a really simple angle that we all have in common. There's nothing yeah. sleazy. There's nothing unethical. There's nothing, yeah. anything about that. It's just, it's as pure as it gets saying, here is the need. Here is the solution. Yeah. 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 So it's been so fun, like studying the great thinkers and trying to say, okay, how does that relate? Like, how does that relate? You know, and, and then start to incorporate those things into a business model and talking to you, I don't believe in any coincidences. They're all 
cooperative incidences of some kind. <laughs> there's always a message or a learning when there's an engagement like this. And probably I will realize at some point, every single thing that catches my attention has some message in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you become hyper aware, you know, self-realized as they say. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you, you talked about one of your very favorite principles being the observe and interact. Mm -hmm. um, catching and storing energy is another really uh, important one. Uh, de designing from patterns to details. Like, uh, I'm a huge fan. I, I grew up in the permaculture era of Jeff Lawton, right? I love Jeff. <laughs> oh, man, he's so wacky. I love watching all yeah. of his videos. He's just, yeah, yeah he's, he's an infectious personality. But when you when you take a look at most of his videos, that's really what he's showing is the patterns that happen on a macro kind of level of any land and using those as the strengths of that particular area, right? Yeah. And I think that's something that we need to think about because if we are to take the neighborhoods and cities and whatever else that we have at present and shift them towards something that is voluntarily different and more sustainable than what we have now, we have to think about the patterns that already happen. Where I'm at at the base of the mountain, we get more snow, we get more uh, precipitation, we get a lot more wind, we get all of these things. How do we use that area and that the patterns that already happen there to the greatest strength of the, of the design that we can have, especially, you know, in this case, you're going to, if you don't want your fruit trees to be decimated in the first few years or to start bending one way, knowing that we have a lot of wind, we need those evergreens at the boundaries in order to create wind blocks and barriers, but in places that aren't going to create really tall shade over 40 years, right? Because that creates a problem down the line for your kids or whoever yeah. takes on yeah. the line. Yeah. So again, it's all a pattern-based thing though, like, uh, uh, and thinking about, you know, also the, the swells, that's where I was talking about Jeff Lawton. He's, he's a huge advocate of swells. I think that thinking about those types of things in terms of the design for each individual's yard is really important because even just two blocks away, you might have a special microclimate or something that is going to curtail. It, it might look like a problem at first, but every problem really is a solution once you start to look at it from that angle. It's just an opportunity to find something that fits that condition better than maybe what you had in mind, right? Yeah, oh, completely. Um, and you brought up catch and store energy. So we talk about this all the time in our in our business. So when we first um, hit the high wire with Dell Big Tree and that show went out, um, I was sharing with that, I said, we have to find ways to catch this incoming energy it's going to be immense and it was there was yeah, a I couple of weeks where i didn't sleep much and it was joyful the whole time <laughs> i mean and, and i do like sharing yeah. with people this because because i think other people can will get benefit out of my experience i lost everything like i i went from zero to about 20 million dollars in net worth and then as i started losing that i started trying to hold on to it and i went to this fear based thing and i read this book by this uh, hicks um, um, it, uh, esther hicks and yeah. jerry do you know yeah, the yeah. law of attraction stuff yeah. love that guy i love her um, anyway, he wrote a book about when um, people who made some money start losing it, they usually lose all of it before yeah. they turn it around again. And I was, I read that book and I still had some money left. I'm like, I'm not, that's not going to be me. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I got down to when we launched, I had put that last bit on the credit cards to, to get to that point. But it was three months before that that I let go all the fear. And I said, I'm going for it a hundred percent. I'm putting everything in and something, when you do that, the universe says, holy shit, this person's ready. Yeah. And, and it was what has happened since then. It's just been one layer of magic. So anyway, as these leads were coming in and these customers and this, all this energy was coming in, we we're like, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. And we put together structures where we could, capture that energy and then direct it towards the exact solution and then communicate this 
Um, and I'll give you one example um, that is, I think, really helpful for this expansion, this rapid expansion, is when we make profits, we take some, we take whatever we feel like taking. Yeah. Um, but I don't ever want to store billions of dollars or hundreds of billions. Like if, if Apple spent 1% of what they had in the bank, they could change the world overnight. Yeah. In fact, I just challenged Elon Musk. Um, somebody said, if you use 2% of your wealth, you could uh, solve world hunger, right? And he was a green guy speaking about climate change. Bullshit. What I'm talking about <laughs> is with $6 billion, which is 2% of Elon's uh, net worth and stocks and stuff, um, he could put $6,000 million, or no, million dollar food forests with the educational content and the inspiring details about how this is done in 6,000 of the world's biggest cities. Wow. That That's was, it. I mean, a million dollar food forest. When I think about that logistically, okay, I'm assuming some of that's going into labor, some of that, of course, into infrastructure. But let's take even a, a $500,000 chunk and put that into plants. Oh, my God. The amount of food and medicine that can be produced in, you know, it's mind blowing what can be produced in a quarter of an acre. Yeah. It's exceptionally mind blowing when you get something the size of a city park, which would yeah. probably be like a million dollar food forest. Yes. So, oh my God. And trails through the park with educational plaques that say, this is how much effort this takes. This is what the benefits, this is the yield and get really down to brass tacks. And when you do that at six out, it's done. Like literally overnight it's done. Yeah. So, so that's the message. We're calling these people out and, and one of them is going to, who is actually integrous or maybe wanting to be integrous. Yeah. It, they're going to see this and they're going to say, holy shit, they might hear it from your show. And so we're doing a lot of these, we're taking our money and turning it back in and we're building food for us at schools and churches and food banks and community centers. And then that becomes marketing, which more. Yeah. It's crazy because it's just like, you know, when, when you actually put the plants in the ground, they're really small next year, they get a little bit, especially with your fruit trees, right? Yeah. Typically, you have to start them off a seed or take a graft for the first couple of years. They don't do squat, diddly squat. They just take it and take and take resources until they mature. But then the second that you put them in the ground, usually it's about two years until you get your first flush after three years, bigger yeah. flush, four years, five years. And especially, you know, if you're doing active pruning and other things in order to increase the yield and the volume and making sure that all of the plants around there can support that it gets bigger and more exponential each and every year. We've yeah. seen that with our peach trees here. We moved into this house, peach trees were planted about two years before we moved in, three new ones, three different varieties. Absolutely none of them bore any fruit the first two years. And then this year, gangbusters, it went crazy. But I had to do yeah. a lot of interdependent planting too in order to end some good pruning in order yeah. to get them where they're at. Yes. And so we talk about stacking functions. So now pruning, right? Most people, when they prune, they go out and they cut a bunch of branches off of a tree and they lay them down, which is great. They lay them down and they become food for the next year's tree. A lot of trees, you take that little, you, you know, you notch the, um, the bark, yeah. you put a tennis ball or a, a thing with rooting compound. And now when you cut them 10 weeks later, you've got a $20 or $10, $20 fruit tree. Yeah. So you just turned three to five minutes of effort into 20 bucks at scale. That's a business all by itself. Yeah. So when we do these million dollar food forests in city parks all around the world, they become profit centers to that city massively. That's exactly so everybody right. wins. Well, and there's, there's jobs, of course, you know, and this is the thing. Okay. I've worked on this for so many years. I, think that agriculture the way that it actually works and economics the way that it actually works need to be seen eye to eye it's just like our clothing and our textiles and anything vegetative we have such a slave labor mentality and most people in the west would not like to admit this but when you look at the dynamics of how we're shipping around the world for the lowest prices and importing and all these other things 
we are using, there's no other term for it, slave labor, where you are barely meeting the needs of those who are working with clothing, with food, with shelter. That is what every slave was provided by their slave owners, right? Yeah, All throughout right. history. Right. So if they're working just for those basic fundamentals, that is really a slave. It doesn't matter what else. That's what a slave does. They work yeah. for their fundamentals. Yeah. Um, so when a free person, quote unquote, ends up engaging in their food, they say, oh, well, why would I grow potatoes in my yard when I can go and buy a sack of them for, you know, $2.50 or five bucks or whatever, right? This is the thing that we need to really end up changing. We need to value the food that we're eating and, and disassociate from the slave labor food that is coming in because actually we're not contributing to the well-being of people in Panama or in Mexico or many other countries by buying our food from there. Right. We're hurting the system. The, the financial system there is so screwed. Right. A hundred percent. And what I'd like to do is take that same exact thought process and pack it down to what's in it for me, right? Because yeah. that's what usually gets people to take action is when they realize that it's better for them because a lot of people don't look at the global perspective like we're looking at. It. And that's where you say, okay, let's take a peach tree, right? You plant a peach tree, costs you, you go, you buy it at Lowe's and you put it ripe, you can, and, and I do want to show a couple really easy ones. Like you add mulch, you add some soil amendment, some good soil, some warm compost and some mulch. It takes you an extra 20 or 30 minutes. You add some stuff maybe once or twice a year. If that's all you did, you'd be ahead of most peach trees out there, right? That's in the true, backyard, true. Yeah. right? Um, so what's the return on that one peach tree going to be after four to five years? You're looking at a hundred percent ROI probably in the value, just in the peaches alone. Yeah. And that's just the dollar value. Now, every year after that, you'll get a multiple of that value, you know? So all of a sudden you're looking at like a seven year ROI of what? 400%, maybe or 500%. More, yeah. Now that's insane. Where else are you going to get that? And this is, you can look this up. This is just, this is how much an organic peach costs. And this is how much a peach tree will yield if it's growing right. So now you're looking at it like, that's just a no brainer. And then when you stack that and scale that sideways and vertically, now you're looking at, this is what I should be doing and not should, this is what I'm going to do next. Yes, exactly. <laughs> And it, it should meet eye to eye too with a person putting in a certain amount of time versus what they get out of the system. Yeah. But only if you're thinking really in terms of permaculture and or food forestry terms, because every year that you just plant an annual garden, especially if you're not using permaculture principles, just annuals, no perennials, no fruit trees, no other things. You, I've tried and tried and tried and tried. At one point, you know, I even had this philosophy that, okay, if I'm vegan, because I was at one point for many years, I was vegetarian and vegan, almost a decade. I thought, okay, I want to grow everything that I eat. It, it, in theory, it's possible, right? Couldn't mm -hmm. do it. Never could do it. I always needed things that I couldn't end up actually growing. And the amount of food that I was able to consume was far greater than what I was able to produce at any given yeah. time you can grow yeah. greens like crazy but you can't live off of greens alone you know you don't want to <laughs> you don't want, to, <laughs> don't want exactly. to uh and yeah. then fruits all have their season right so yeah. even if you get an ever-bearing strawberry it's not like every single day all year long are you getting right. fruits you know you get two really good flushes of these things and then there are fruits that happen in every different season, there's seeds and nuts that happen in their own seasons. You have some time like this time of year, harvest time, you know, even late August through about early November in, in most of the United States, that you have really hip harvests on tons of things, except for yeah. grains, you know, grains, you, you can sometimes push, uh, uh, depending on your climate and stuff, uh, two harvests a year, but still, it's, it's hard to grow everything that you consume in one location. Uh, yeah, that was something sure. that I've never been able to do. Also, if I would have traded my time for money, I would have been able to buy all of those things and have so much more money left over. Yeah. The amount of effort that I was putting in was really difficult. 
And this is with most annual gardening, right? But the second that you start to diversify to more perennial type things and not planting your annuals uh, or planting them, but not doing, uh, not relying on your tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, pumpkins, squash, you know, root veggies, things like that. Now you have so much more diversity that you can draw from. You have a more balanced diet. And it turns out that it conditions the soil to actually help the growth of your annual plants in such a better way, right? Oh, that's amazing. Yes. And I think annuals are a result of hybridization for, you know, hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, where perennials are like the natural, like the original way was nobody thought about what do you mean growing food? It's right there. It's yeah, growing exactly. it's all around us. Yeah. <laughs> growing food. Like, what are you talking about? Right. And the same thing with livestock, right? I mean, you, when you have a system like this, you've got the birds and the livestock in the system. Yes. And you want to be the apex predator in that system. You harvest one that has lived an incredibly healthy life. The meat is amazing. And that transitions that energy. Now you be, it becomes part of your energy, right? Exactly. That's, that's what we're, we're working on and I'm visualizing and, and designing into Gauls, all of those different things to then show them. And I'm going to have a lot of things where I don't know what I don't know. And that's when I'm going to reach out to you and say, hey, how do I make this tincture, you know, and so on and <laughs> yeah. so on. And then, and then, and then I'm going to shine a light on the work you do because it's so valuable, especially in the sickness and illness and disease and dis-ease of this day, right? I think that after a certain amount of time, nobody will make this shit anymore. I mean, I love this stuff, but it won't be needed because we'll literally be consuming this all day, every day. Exactly. You know, but for now it's needed. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I dream of a point where people will take accountability for their own wellness materials by way of the things that they're stewarding in and around their yard, the way that they think about living and and harmoniously uh, blending in with their ecology. You know, a lot of our research right now is showing that what we would refer to as a human microbiome and epigenetic uh, causes of disease, which is to say diseases where our genes adapt to our, our external surroundings, they are so dependent upon environmental wellness. If we don't have healthy water and soil and, you know, of course, food um, and air to breathe, if we don't have these clean essentials, we will inevitably contract diseases because the environment in which we're in is itself polluted. And because we are symbiotes of that environment, we have no choice. Like it's just, it's inherent. The toxicity is there. Yeah, hundred percent. Yes. And that's where it's such an interesting time because it's coming at us from every direction. It's coming at us mentally and physically in this air and the fluoride and all these different things. And so there's this thing I call upon and I ask about, and I don't know the answer to this one yet, but how much is spirit going to interject and how powerful is that when you see these people that get bit by snakes when they're in these trances and they don't get affected or Joe Dispenza, Uh Dr. Joe, one of my favorite people in the world talking about these miracles where people can't see and then they can see and he's found a way to duplicate it and it all has to do with centering into the vibration and raising through meditation and then all of a sudden we heal so that's what i think is i think that's literally going to pop here sometime it kind of is right now i think that it's going to be a societal shift of consciousness at such an epic degree that we're just like (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can see like the the steps of it sociologically are already we're deep in the process right now. I think right now, if I was to explain where we're really at there in the laboratory, you know, in the alchemical tree philosophy, every different alchemical process happens on a personal level. Their holographic fractal principle principle is just like permaculture principles. And in fact, there's 12 of those just like there are 12 permaculture principles. And so they each have their corollaries, right? But realistically, calcination is where people start to feel angry. They start to feel mad and things like this. And this is where the fires to burn things down to their essential form, leaving all of the unessential material behind um, or pyrolytically converting it, it would be the technical term, ends up 
being one of the first and most important steps in the process of actually making good medicine. You have to get to the basic core of the material. And the only way we can really do that as a, as a country right now, as a nation, as a globe even, is to continue to experience the things that are infuriating to us and let those, like I was talking about earlier, let those emotions actually fuel us to the solutions that we need to see in order to move beyond the the conditions Absolutely. that enraged us in the first place. Yes, because they break down our thought of knowing everything. Yep. And as soon as we say, wait a minute, I don't know shit. You know, then all of a sudden, a lot of knowledge comes in. Yes. And then there's probably a point where, okay, like, you know, now all of a sudden you become a know-it-all again. And, and I remember being this guy too. I remember after I made that money and I remember thinking that I was pretty special. And then it just beat the shit out of me, right? <laughs> and so now my goal is to always raise my vibration this way. But I know, I know that sometime I'm going to all of a sudden get off track. And, and that's the ebb and flow. And what Thomas Jefferson was talking about when he said the tree of liberty must be nourished from time to time with yeah. the blood of patriots and tyrants for that is its natural manure. What a reference considering. What a country. reference, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the ebb and flow of the human experience. Oh man, it so is. In fact, speaking about uh, ebb and flow, that's actually that that kind of ties into some of these permaculture principles, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, integrating rather than separating, yes. especially with cycles, because there's going to be weird cycles with weather. There's going to be weird cycles with lots of things. But how do we plan for and integrate that into our design? And how do we also separate out the aspects that we don't want or need like if there's too much rainfall or precipitation how do you respond to that in a single season and then also plan for not only periods of too much moisture but not enough moisture as well and yeah. to create that resiliency in the soil i think those are big questions man those are ones that i want to get to like i i can see like when it comes to dry areas um i bought this farm in nicaragua and i had the great fortune of spending time with the farmers that had lived there for uh, 30 or 40 years, if not more. And I talked to the, the kid there who is now about 30 years old. Um, and he said that, yeah, when he grew up there, it was all forested and there were streams running through the whole property. And, and I was like, streams, where are they now? He said, oh, after they cut down all the trees, all the streams dried up. Yep. And at, I had no idea what transpiration was. I didn't know that the trees are what create the rain by sucking water out of the air out of the earth and filtering the water and putting it up in the sky what a magical system that is what a magical I, system I, what yeah yeah so so yeah what you're saying is exactly right now it's thinking long term and and that's that's a major thing in permaculture and that's somewhere where i question myself and my tactics and my strategy is i believe that we have to go we have to move our asses, right? I think that th we're in process of a systemic collapse and the, fat, the more people we can inspire now to grow food, there's a tipping point. And I think that we're close to the tipping point. I don't know, you know, yeah. so that's where I go to the suburban backyard because there's resources, there's everything is there already except for life. And yeah. when we add life to that, that's the zone one. And then as we get the LIDAR and we start looking at big maps, then we can design whole, you know, whole quadrants and I mean, big parcels. And that's when it gets just crazy exciting. Well, let's go ahead and take a break. When we come back, let's unpack that. And let's talk specifically about some of the design work that you do uh, and things that some of our listeners can actually tap into and get designs for, for their own yard. Love it. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back. Are you looking for the highest quality herbal supplements and remedies for your home apothecary? Or perhaps you're looking to take your spellcraft or magical workings to the next level. Whatever your reason might be, we have hundreds of herbal spagyric items available and every purchase supports our work and helps bring spagyria into the light of the modern world. 
Here at the Phoenix Aurelius Research Academy, we produce dozens of items of spagyric pharmacopoeia for our research work each year, even though we only need a few small samples for our research purposes. And as a result, we can make the remaining quantities available to the public in our online spagyric apothecary. And you can rest easy knowing that only the highest quality natural, organic, biodynamic, and ethically wildcrafted materials go into the making of our products, and every purchase you make helps to fund our research with which ultimately advances spagyric wellness in the modern age. As an Alchemiculture podcast listener, you can get your hands on our professionally crafted small batch spagyric products for 15% off all the time, simply using the coupon code LISTEN15. So go ahead and browse our enormous selection of products and get yourself something new today. Visit www.phoenixaurelius.org forward slash apothecary and enter coupon code LISTEN15 to save 15% off. And thanks so much in advance for supporting our research. All right, folks, we're back from the break. Again, here we're, we are with uh, Jim from uh, foodforestabundance.com. We've been chatting pretty much about tons of different permaculture and, and sustainability related topics, but you know, we really want to get into how can people who own a home or are renting a home and have permission, things like this, how can they start to utilize these principles in a way that's coherent, that's not overwhelming, and that can help to, to help them be part of the, this solution, this emerging, you know, food forest solution and permaculture solution. And you've got some of those answers, right? Because you do this design for people. Yes, I, I really feel like we've got it all put together and now it's expanding globally. Um, we started six months ago. We're now serving customers in 16 countries in like 42 or three states. Um, and every one of those customers that I've spoken to, which is almost every single one of them, um, hundreds of them, want to become a demonstrator of what's possible. So over a very short time, actually, they're telling their friends and they're telling their friends. So I'm going to start as far as how do you do it at home? If let's say you're on a super tight budget, you don't need any extra money for this, maybe two bucks extra. You can go to the store and you can buy organic, healthy produce instead of some of the other stuff that's not. And you know what it is, right? You, yeah. you feel it and it even says it right there. Uh, buy mature um, produce and start taking the seeds out. Go onto YouTube and look at how to propagate those seeds, right? And then play with it, have fun with it. And the whole thing should be fun. If there's any point where it's not, then look at the why you're doing it again, step back and say, why am I doing this? And then you intentionally design fun into the, pro the process. Um, which it works. I mean, that's what I do all day long and I can't tell you how much fun I'm having. So <laughs> then we said, okay, what's the best business in the world? How do we scale this? So we created this cooperative, which is exact. It's a landscaping business, except for it's food forestry. Yeah. So we have a design team. So a customer says, I would like a food forest in my backyard. All right. And if you want to speed up time, you don't want to go through the process of buying stuff and starting seeds and going on YouTube. If you want to have it done like right now, then you can call us up and we will, um, we will connect you with one of the designers that are on our team. And that designer then will ask a bunch of questions and get the proper details from you, like videos and pictures of your space. They'll get a Google Earth. They can do some large scale things if needed. We can come to your property if needed. Um, a lot of the backyard systems, they're like a quarter acre, a 10th of an acre, 2000 square feet. They're, they're pretty simple, they're on flat ground. Then we create a design, it's a 45 page document that gives all sorts of details about growing food the easy way. And in that document will be your custom landscape blueprint. Then if you want, it's a DIYable document. So you can then DIY it. Or if you don't feel like shoveling mulch, you can call us up. And by this time we'll be in direct communication. We can then bring one of our cooperatives to your house and the cooperatives, they're landscapers. So they will find out what all the costs are for all the fruit trees and berry bushes and all the food you want. 
And then they'll find out what the cost is for the mulch and the soil, the soil amendments, the worm castings, and all the layers that are going to be yeah. in the document, in the blueprint, we call it. And then they're going to add on labor and a margin, exactly like landscaping. So what we're, we're inviting anybody in the world who wants a fantastic business is to become a food force cooperative. We earn seven to 12%. We have no NDAs, no non-competes. You can leave anytime you want. It's about, are we providing seven to 12% worth of value to you? And the answer to so far is, holy cow, it's a lot more than that. You're because right. we, I mean, I had a podcast this morning with uh, Crow and I'm on your amazing show now. So the word's going out. So we're starting to attract people all over. So that means we're also going to provide some of the business for you. Now, we don't want that to be your core because we want you and we want to help you through our marketing systems to get out to your community, but we will help you. In fact, our internal mission is to serve uh, our cooperatives. That, yeah, I, well, I think that that's amazing. And again, seven to 12 percent in terms of, you know, that's basically like an affiliate or a referral commission. Yeah. Basically, yeah. it's like, yeah. hey, we're, we're, we've set up the infrastructure. Here's how to do it, where to source things, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to filter tons of business your way. So this yeah. is a hyper sustainable way of thinking about things. And what I love about it, actually, Jim, is that it's very decentralized in a lot of ways like you said it's not an nda you're not trying to consume these businesses you're not buying them out they get the opportunity to voluntarily participate in what's going on because of the amount of business that is being funneled to them and how it helps them and diversifies their abilities too most landscaping businesses are doing the pesticide thing the grass thing etc in a feeble attempt to maintain business throughout the year and yeah. you know of course like their bread and butter is working on new housing developments laying out the grass things like this yeah that, but, that's exactly yeah that, that's exactly right and that the poisons oh gosh that that's a tough one for me is to see that the poison signs out here with the red heart yeah right there's a red <laughs> heart and it says keep your kids off this will kill them right yeah that is so insidious and wicked. Um, but yes, <laughs> the, the, the model is, is great because it's the solution. And it's a, it's a landscaping business where our main job is to dig holes, put food in the ground, shovel mulch, and put the layers in and plant the plants. It's not hard. It's not concrete. It's not hard packs. In fact, when I started, I bought a wheelbarrow, two shovels, and two rakes, and some gloves. And then I would rent a truck if I had a big plant delivery, or I would hire the delivery for the mulch, right? And so you can literally start this business um, uh, on fairly a shoestring budget. Yep. And oh, this is huge. We are, and I believe this hasn't happened yet, but it's very much in process. I believe we're going to be um, coming out with a financing entity that allows us to finance the installation of food for us here within about a month. That would be ideal, actually, to create low interest loans for people who want to be able to do this, yeah. because then the installation isn't all like the, the financial burden isn't all on top of them. So like, you know, for instance, with the design, it looks like, you know, on your website, it's, you know, for uh, up to a quarter acre. So people who have small backyard lots or front yard, side yards, et cetera, lots and want to set these up in their house you know, they can do this for about 800 bucks, but then that's the design, right? So yep. then you have to buy the fruit trees, you have to buy the mulch, you have yeah. to buy even the soil sometimes to get it amended properly. Or, you know, yeah. I'm not sure if you take their lawns and just are cardboarding deeply over the top and then laying yeah. over the top. So, you know, all of those things, I've done all of those. I, I finance those things. They can be very tedious and create a lot of expense if you're creating a brand new garden straight yeah straight out of nothing. So yeah. to be able to create a good financing option that understands yeah. this point is important because yeah. if you take it to the bank and say, Hey, I want to take out a small, you know, a small loan for 5,000 bucks. And they ask you, you know, what's it for half the time, they just look at you like you're crazy. And it's like, why? No, we're not. No, right. this, right. there's no for return on our investment to this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that's the way yeah. that they look at it is like, well, what are you doing? That's going to help you pay this thing off it doesn't seem to make sense. Like when you do a home repair that increases the, the value and the equity of the home. Right. And so for instance, in their financial model mind, it's like, Oh yeah, that's a no brainer. We can do this. 
Yeah. So when, just... when you do it with uh, produce and gardens, the financial model at present doesn't typically understand that. So right. offering a financial arm that is meant for that would fill a very serious need. Yes, I'm so excited about it. When people can pay instead of, let's say they're doing a big one at 25 grand, when they can pay 429 bucks a month or whatever, which after a certain amount of time, the amount of value you're going to get out of your food forest is going to be way more yeah, than that. Yeah. Right. So now you've got a net positive. Now it's going to take a few years for that to come. Yes. So you've got on the, fr on the front end, you've got some expense, but over a short, very relatively short amount of time, your, your return on that investment is awesome. So that's the next, that's the next big thing we got coming in. And, and I think it's going to probably three to 10 X the actual volume of food we put in the ground. I, yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. I think that you're absolutely right. Again, like the, the need is serious. There are so many people who are buying homes that have established gardens and food forests. There are entire websites that are set up that way. Yeah. But when you talk to banks about financing these things, unless you already have the money and, and the labor force and whatever else, and you're willing to do it yourself, put in you know either elbow grease or throw the money at it yourself, there's not entities out there that are very interested in funding this. So I think that it's great to do that. And that's, that would be something that I would tell all, my personal suggestion would be to all new homeowners, the second that you buy the home, install the garden, install yeah. the food forest. Like it should be just as important that you start that as soon as you possibly can, as much as it is like unpacking your clothes and things like that. It, because yeah. over the course of, of the mortgage that you have, you want that, that place to actually increase in its value. Yeah. And there are two different values that you have to keep in mind. One is financial value equity right but then the the next is intrinsic value and yes it has no intrinsic value in the future it won't have any financial value because the function is not there in in our current system and people are becoming aware of the value of the function of this right so yeah. it's just perfect how it all aligns um some other thought that popped into my head um well, the, the food force and public areas thing is going to be a lot of fun. In fact, if anybody listening wants to be part of this, we have a structure whereby you can engage your community and create a, a day where the community gets together and maybe everybody goes and buys maybe like a, a wedding. What do they call those? Uh, registry. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Except for we'll have a design made for you for your public area and then you can send the design out to your network and everybody can pick a certain amount of fruit trees and berry bushes and things that are on that design right we'll actually have it laid out right and then you have a community day where everybody comes in and everybody might spend 100 200 bucks but they just you've now got 50 60 70 different fruit trees and different things that will literally feed your grandkids you know, and so there's all these different ways to do it. We've even created curriculum for schools where they can teach permaculture and all these principles. And so, I mean, that's the next step is to inspire the people who can say yes, who actually say, yes, here's the public land that I'm in charge of. And I'd like to be a good steward of this land. So we would love your help with a food forest. Ah, oh, man, uh, that this, this particular future that you and I share as a vision is just so important because it heals so many things. Yeah. It takes care of the debt of slavery that we all carry. There's never been a time in history, today included, where civilization as we know it is not built on the back of slavery. Right. The only people that I have seen that are really living truly sustainable lives are in very tiny, very remote villages where they steward everything themselves yep. in this type of manner anyway. And we look at them as the uncivilized ones, while <laughs> the rest of us actually use a financial model to push our own way and enslave those that want to work with the food. They're always considered second class citizens, like the migrant workers here in the United States that come and harvest the food for dirt cheap, right? Yep. Um, we have to shift that model we have to be responsible for the food that we eat, for how we 
engage with our own sustainability and creation, that's what sustains our life. That's actually perennially, you could make as much money or mine as much gold as you want, that's not going to keep you alive. No, that's not it's, a resource that people know how to work with. It's exactly. And I like to think of it in terms of we get to it's yes. we're, we're leading the way everybody conscious and, and talking about these types of solutions is literally creating the future of our society. And we get to do that. It's is we were here for a reason. And yep. the reason for me is to enjoy and be part of this process and do everything I can to manifest to the best of my ability, right? And, and then this other thing just popped in I want to share is what are your family's odds of getting cancer when you have a food forest in your backyard where you eat maybe just a few handfuls of healthy vine ripened food half the year? Right. Yeah. If you just, there's a number, I don't know what the number is, but I bet that odds of going cancer goes way down in that certain scenario. I bet so too, especially because you can control the microbes inside of there. And like, it's like Bakashi uh, compost that people would inherently have to create. Okay. I'm just saying this, like when you grow your food, you realize that you're actually growing so much that unless you have an outlet to sell it and get it out. And even then you still have tons of waste, right? Yeah. Tons of food that's being produced that you can't consume. As, as a gardener, you're constantly giving, you know, even just your home gardener has like a million zucchini every yeah. summer. It's like, <laughs> yeah. take it, take it. It's like coming out of your ears every year. Um, those things can go back into the systems. So there is no waste. You create Bakashi. Bakashi is shown to actually completely eliminate radioactive waste and to start to break down heavy metal yeah. contamination. So even you're like, oh, well, I can grow my own food, but it's still going to have alarium, uh, aluminum, barium, strontium from geoengineering and chemtrails, whatever, right? No, you don't need those things. If you have all of your archaea, you have your bakashi, you have various microbes that are inside of the soil, they perform what Dr. Lewis Kervin called biochemical transmutation. Wow. And it's literally where they will take a particular metal and turn it into a mineral or a methylated form of that metal that it can actually be utilized by the plants and by the fungi that further break it down and keep breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down to usable forms for the plants or to completely non-toxic forms. So this is what people need to understand is that right now with commercial agriculture, non-organic, inorganic commercial agriculture, tons of chemical inputs. The higher the chemical input and the less sustainable the, the form of agriculture, the higher the rate of cancer. It's yeah. been shown over and over and over. Correct. There's a direct correlation. Yeah. What's the name of the guy who biochemical transmutation? Dr. Lewis Kervrin. Oh yeah. He was a Soviet scientist. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's a the biochemical transmutation was a term that he created and published a paper and then later a book by, um, and he shows, and I, I've actually followed this. So um, University of California, Berkeley has all sorts of different types of soil samples available, uh, soil microbe samples. And using just some very basic microbes, you can take pieces of heavy metal in soil, in dishes, and place the little bits of heavy metal, measure them beforehand, put them in there and submit that soil to various types of, of chemical testing, usually wow. GCMS. They'll tell you exactly how much of this metal is dispersed in the soil. Then what you do is you introduce those, those soil microbes, those organisms, and you find out that they start to proliferate and create all sorts of changes. And in as little as three months, they can take iron inside of soil and transmute it to magnesium, or they can transmute it like nickel to manganese and all sorts of other things. And so once you understand that that is possible, um, and it's just like the work that we do over here with spagyrozyme, we have a microbial uh, decomposition mechanism that works as a stubble digester, it works as a waste and, and septic for animal uh, manure lots and feeding lots, it wow. works for, you know, human septic systems, it works for biogas systems, it, you know, we consume it as a health supplement as well, because it's supposed to be part of the healthy, normal human microbiome. Yeah. And 
uh, it will break apart crude oil and coal. It separates out the paraffin layer. It breaks it all down into its atomic elements and components. And then from there, you can use other forms of bacteria, fungi, et cetera, and archaea in order to break things down into a way that is just completely non-toxic. So if you take, you know, some of my neighbor's soil sample, you know, from over here on this other side of the orchard from me and take his soil, he's heavy chemical inputs on his grass and, you know, his tomatoes and everything else. And then take our soil sample, you'll be able to see that we have absolutely none of the heavy metals. We have none of the radi radiation, even trace levels of it through rain and other things. We have absolutely none of the aflatoxins. And this is the thing that most people aren't talking about. Aflatoxins on foods, especially coming from more humid environments like uh, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and especially from the tropics are really freaking high. They're crazy. Wow. They're everywhere. And then you get rid of all of those once you have the right micro balance in the soil, because now you don't have a damaged organism that nature says we need to break it down and compost it in order to create as healthy a soil as we can. You're already creating the healthy soil. And so all that comes out of it is healthy material. Jeez, dude, that was the one thing that somebody asked me lately and I didn't have an answer to was the, the, the stuff coming down out of the sky, the chemtrail stuff, right? Um, the barium and the, and you just gave the answer. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Yeah, it's so simple. It's just, it's cultivating the microbes, man. And, you know, there's so many ways of doing it. You know, your Jadam fertilizers, you know, are you familiar with that? Jim? No, Jadam? I've heard of that just lately though. Tell me, can you spell that? Oh yeah, Jadam, it's a J-A-D-A-M. And it's a style of, uh, I call it a fermentalizer because it's a fertilizer that is made by just performing an anaerobic fermentation of anything. So you go and cut your grass, you stick it in a bucket, cover it with, with a rock and then pour water in over it and then stick a lid on that bucket. Well, all of that water and all of all of the starches and everything inside of there and the yeasts and the bacteria that are already on the grass, they end up in that anaerobic environment in the water, fermenting and creating kind of a very pungent smelling solution. But if you just take a little bit of that, you know, let's say um, it's usually one to 20 parts at greatest dilution or one to 200 parts in standard dilution and apply that in a watering cycle as a root drench every once in a while for your plants, now they're able to get various nutrients. So like, for instance, this is the way I feed all of my tomatoes. Wow. When they're in vegetative phase each year, I clip off some of the vegetation during that vegetative phase and I ferment it. And when they're flowering, I do the same thing. I clip off the flowers and I ferment that. And then when they are fruiting, then I'll do that. And at the end of the season, I'll take the roots and do it with that. Now you have a rooting hormone that is naturally taken, specifically designed for nightshades or tomatoes in particular. You have a flowering for, uh, fertilizer. You have a vegetative fertilizer because it contains everything that that plant needs during that particular phase. And you're just applying it in basically a homeopathic dilution to the plant. Wow, man, I'm so excited. So we're creating this studio at Galt's and that's going to be my job every day is to show people these types of things. I can't wait to have you on a podcast um, to talking about this and um, because this is beautiful stuff that I have just barely touched the surface of. Oh yeah, it's so cool. Like I started getting these ideas. I, I first called them alchema preps because in biodynamics, we have biodynamic preparations or what are called yeah. BD preps, right? So um, they're made primarily from unique combinations of animal. Most of them are unique combinations of animal and uh, vegetable materials. Like you'll take chamomile flowers and stuff the intestines of a pig with it and then ferment those. And then when they, they're done, that preparation contains so much of this microbial wow. force that you're able to spread it out in your compost in very tiny, small amounts, and it inoculates the entire the compost thing. pile. So that when you spread that out over your garden, now the whole garden is benefiting from that. And Jeez. so- you know, they'll stuff like a stag's bladder with uh, various different types of things. But for me, that was like, practically, it's like, okay, cool. These are the old world methods of doing this that are very sustainable and handed down from tradition to tr 
tradition, but what about the neighborhood gardener who can't just hunt a stag, (laughs) you know, exactly. You just don't have the bladder available or the intestines available or a hog's head to stuff, you know, certain herbs in. how do you do it? Well, the answer has already been around for thousands of years. So, you know, the Koreans call it jadam. I call it fermentalizers. Other people have just done this, you know, very traditionally for many thousands of years by putting them in ceramic pots and covering with a little bit of water and a stone. And they have traditionally applied these during the irrigation season when things would overflow and, and that makes sense. I always ask, how can I see that actually being applied in a natural system and during the irrigation system, which is the flood season, right? Then all of a sudden these things that are rotting on the forest floor get swept out and some of that energy, that water goes in and it lays on the plains and comes. So that makes complete sense. Uh, Yeah, it's what's happening naturally in nature. It's taking all of that stuff and it's creating standing pools of all of that debris that stays under the level of the water. And as that settles into the top of the soil, now those microorganisms in those top two inches are just, they're game busters, man. That's amazing. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah, at any rate, uh, these are the types of things that, you know, people, I think if we were to implement them in neighborhood situations in a matter of five years, there would be so much food coming from inside the United States in every locality that it would drastically lessen the amount of import export material coming in from other countries. It would help to destabilize the current financial models. Again, you have to take a look. Numbers, there's monetary traces for everything. If you take a look at State Street Investment Company, you take a look at uh, Vanguard Group Investment Yes. These guys are in capital. These, these three really are at the top of every investment, yeah. meaning that they really own Monsanto. Yeah. They're, you know, yeah. they're one in the same now. They own Dow Jones. They own all of the other agrochemical chem- companies that own 90% of the world's food supply. And again, when you take a look at how do you own people? How do you own slaves? You own people by their food. Yeah. When you take accountability for your existence, your food, your day-to-day living, the things that you need, and provide those things for yourself, it destabilizes that old system. You don't, you're not living day in and day out giving your money to it. It's the most important change at the present moment that somebody could make. I couldn't agree more. And, and this, this is, if, if Kissinger said how to control people is to control their food, then that's the problem. Then the solution is exactly what you're talking about. Exactly what we're talking about yeah. is take Absolutely. back that, the, which is the most logical thing we could do on every level for us as yep. individuals and as a society. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you start to, when you are producing food and you're contributing to your community, your community comes closer together. And then it's easier to talk about what are the shared principles of your community. And then that switch, it happens through food first because people have to eat together. But then the discussions become what is important for our community. And then that also decentralizes the need for external government. When you are taking accountability and stewardship for yourself, your friends, your family, your community, all of a sudden you find yourself taking accountability for the things that we are paying tremendous amounts of money to have run lackluster for us in a very centralized system that's one size fits all. Instead, we can do the community-based thing, what fits us and curtail it's custom tailored to what we need. Yep. No, I love it, buddy. I'm so glad we had a chance to talk and I'm glad I met you because I, I really am looking forward to expanding and learning from you. And then um, any way I can support what you're doing. Um, this is what it's all about. It's about collaborating and bringing all of this knowledge that has been built up over the years and now using the technology of today and to get it in the hands and the minds of everybody yeah. as much as possible. Well, likewise, brother, I feel the same. Like you're your mission, your work has taken 
ideas and dreams for so many people and making it a reality, making it something that is quantifiable and realistic. And it's helping that jump so much. I'm, I'm just honored for this time. How about you go ahead and tell the audience where they can get a hold of you and what, what you would suggest their next steps are if they want to start a food forest. Gotcha. So you can get a hold of me um, at foodforestabundance.com. And Food Forest Abundance, we're starting to be out all over the place. Um, we've got a lot of different channels in different areas. We're starting to go towards the free speech pl platforms more, but we're still all over. We're still on YouTube and Facebook and so on. Um, and then me personally, if you want to chat with me, it's jim at foodforestabundance.com. That's my direct email. And yeah, if you want to be in the business of helping people grow food, which by the way, is a very well positioned business with the food supply chain issues going on right now. Um, it's lucrative, it's got a nice margin and it's a, it's a win-win. Then that's awesome. We're, we're looking to expand our cooperative network well, even further that globally. We'd like thousands of cooperative partners here within about a year, year and a half. And um, it's, a, it's an unsustainable business model. I do want to share that. We plan to be done in 20 years because there's food for us everywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a short-term thing to get us to yeah. where we need to be. Yes, but you know, when you, when you come at it at, with that approach and that energy, it's just it's just fun. Yeah. Well, it so. really is. Well, and it it puts a sense of realism into the the industry too. It's like, hey, I'm I'm going to be doing this for a while, but I'll tell you what. When there's tons of food, here's what people are going to need to do. They're going to need to know how to distill apple brandy and, yes. to, you know, from there's those things, yeah. prepare foods. Yes. Preserve and, and, them. Yeah. And, and this is just the tip of the, this is from unsustainable to sustainable, but what about from sustainable to freaking radical abundance? That's going to be the next phase of our business. Let's first get to this place where we've got this regenerative society and then let's explode it to levels that we haven't thought about yet yes oh that's so brilliant well jim again man i just want to thank you so much for all of your time here for all of our listeners out there thank you for your time thank you for watching this episode hopefully this has really inspired you given you the opportunity to think about how to engage in food forestry or maybe even just giving you a couple of new ideas or ways of thinking about things that you can be sustainable on your own, that you can take back a lot of your power, that you can start to take accountability and stewardship over your own life instead of maybe griping, complaining that others are doing it poorly for you. Um, that's a big shift there. It's awesome. But if you've liked this episode, be sure to like it, subscribe to us, hit the bell notification if you're watching on YouTube, share the information with all of your friends. And if you like the work that I'm doing, again, all of these interviews are completely unpaid for us to do as Alchemiculture. So if you like this, the best way of supporting us is considering to purchase uh, one of our spagyrics or sign up for the spagyrics of the month club. All of the links will be down in the description, including to Jim's website, and uh, again, Jim, do you have any closing thoughts for any of the guests? Yes, I'm signing up. Perfect. Yeah, I, you'll, you'll like it. I, take I love it. Five of the, the best pharmacopoeia that I have that we release every single month that get auto shipped straight to your door at like a 60% over, over retail you know, discount. So Gosh, it's, that's fantastic. It's pretty awesome. I'm in. All right, brother. Thank you, man. I'm so honored to be on your show and I uh, appreciate you tons and I'm looking forward to all of it. Likewise, Jim, thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Yes, very soon. Blessings, guys. Okay, blessings. Ciao.